Welcome to the great conversation where ideas matter. Ideas shape markets, but ideas can change the world. Uh, I love stories. In fact, um, story to me raises its beautiful head in every facet of my life since I was a child. Whether it was the Rudyard Kipling stories when I was a kid, the Aesop fables, uh, the biblical stories. Uh, I loved a good story. Hemingway, the Hemingway, Nick Adams stories, fly fishing out in the, uh, in the mountains. And as I be, became part of the workplace, I started asking stories of success and failure and meaning and purpose. So it'd be natural that I'd run across, for those of you who follow The Great Conversation, you know the only way people end up on The Great Conversation is because one of you says, you got to have this guy or this woman on the podcast. You got you to have a great conversation with them. And I had a similar thing happen with a gentleman by the name of Bobby Herrera, who happens to be the president of populace, and we may get into that for a second, but more importantly, he's an author, and he's an author of a story called The Gift of Struggle. Uh, Bobby Herrera, thank you for joining me on The Great Conversation. Healthy underdogs, Ron. Good to connect with you. Oh, great to connect. And uh, Bobby's sitting in Portland, Oregon, I believe. Is that right? That's right. And he just told me a wonderful I already love him and I'm going to have to visit him one day because he already says if we're sitting by a virtual fireplace with a little something, something, his is a good red blend. <laughs> I love that, Bobby. So, so what's your favorite Willamette wine? You know, I, I'm a big fan of um, just about any red blend that tastes good that I can enjoy with a friend. But if you had me pick one, I'd probably go, I'd probably go with a Spanish grape Tempranillo. And, oh, uh, of course. Uh, they, they make, they make some really good ones in this area and Absolutely. keeps your heart young as we, well, as we both know. I, I, uh, I selectively look for only that scientific data that will prove the point that you just made. <laughs> yeah. I don't smell the cork. I just let it, let it, let it do its own work. Yeah. I have, I actually, there, a joke in my family is I have red wine with everything. I don't care what kind of meal we're having. I have red wine with everything. So I'm right with you on that. So Bobby, um, I got to tell you, and, and please community, if you get a chance, pick up his book, read, read some of his blogs. Um, this is a gentleman with a big heart and a big mind. And, um, and I came away after listening to you and reading about you, realizing that you are trying to get you, here's your voice impact on me. I want you, if you were saying something to me, I, I would hear you say, Ron, I want you to have the courage to tell your story warts and all. That's what I got from you. Very simple, I know, but tell us about story and why you found it so important to give that gift to others. Well, one, thanks for the kind words. Um... My dad was a magnificent storyteller, Ron. Uh, I called him the Mexican John Wayne. And <laughs> he, uh, from my earliest memories, if I was asking him a question or if he was trying to teach me something, he would either use some form of parable or metaphor, or if I he was trying to teach me something, you know, he'd say, you know, let me tell you a story. And, you know, growing up as you know, any other kid, you, you, you moan and you groan. It's like, oh, dad, another story. And then as I began my, you know, my professional career after the military and college, I, I started realizing as I'm, you know, as, as my frontal lobe started developing, I guess, that he had given me a gift that is just so powerful in driving clarity um, whether it be in leadership, whether it be in business, you know, stories connect us. They help us see and touch things in a way that we can relate to it. And I just found myself um, applying the same type of communication style that he had given me just by listening to his stories. And so 
uh, I, I credit him with that gift. And it was, um, it was, you know, one of the most precious gifts he ever gave me that I'm grateful for. And, you know, cause when you think about it in business, you know, people often use, you know, I think one of the most overused words is uh, strategy, you know, they say, Hey, what's your strategy? Well, I, I tend to turn that into a more palatable question. I'll be like, Hey, tell me the story you're narrating. Like how did it start? What was the origin? Where is it now? And Hey, take me to the, take me to the future chapters. And you know, story is such a powerful way to help bring that image that any business leader has in their mind and in their heart to life. I love the idea that you tell the story that has happened or is happening, but you also get them to cast the net out to tell the future chapters that haven't been written yet. That that's amazing. And, and you can do that, I think, in a in an empowering way. You know, just sitting across, you know, the fireplace, metaphorically, as you and I are now, and you know, just handing them pen. Well, hey, tell tell me about the story you're writing. You know, like what what's the origin of it? What gives you energy? Like what inspired you to take the leap? Uh, something happened in your life that connected you to a bigger meaning to drive you to say yes, because it, it does take courage. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. You, you know that better than most, Ron. Well, if you get, uh, so for those of you listening to this, if you mm. pick up Bobby's book, he's done something marvelous. He tells a story. Then he raises some questions to ask yourself about that story. So he doesn't tell you what the meaning is. He lets you find your own meaning within it. Am I capturing that right? Uh, yes, the essence of it. Uh, you know, I use stories from my journey, from my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I tied a, a lesson to everyone and how I applied that. And I do close every chapter with, I call them, uh, you know, cartoon bubble questions. They, they make your hamster wheel spin and help you connect it to your own story. Because I, you know, I think that's really probably the most powerful part of a story, you know, uh, whether I'm doing a storytelling session for, you know, CEOs or whether I'm doing it for, you know, what I call kids born on the wrong side of the opportunity to divide like myself, I'll tell them a story, but then um, what it's really doing is it's, it's bringing to life their story and their journey. And I think that's the most powerful part of utilizing stories to uh, help connect us and help bring meaning to what we're trying to do. Yeah, there's something very sacred about the process. Um, and then if you do have a forum, by writing the book, you have a forum. By doing what you do, you have a forum leading a company. And you can start connecting your story to their story, to the employee culture, to your family and friends. It, there's a force multiplier there. There's something spiritual and sacred about that. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think one of the, uh, when you, we start to unpack that as an individual, you know, as a leader, um, regardless of the size of your organization or where, you know, where you play in the ecosystem uh, of, you know, the community you're building, every single person you lead, you know, I, I believe we share three basic desires and that is to stand out, to fit in and to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And, you know, as a leader, we have to tell that story to go back to your opening statement. We have to have the courage to tell our story in an unvarnished human manner. So that creates safety for people to tell theirs. And as a leader, by doing that, we give them what I believe every person in our organization is craving. Like they're craving contribution. Like there's something they want to contribute to. And story does that you know um i've been a part of and led many different organizations so i have a question for you and and you can help me uh color outside the lines i've developed because that's always dangerous when you just color within your own lines all the mm -hmm. time but you said every Every is a powerful word. Every mm -hmm. person wants to stand out, fit in, be, be a part of something bigger. 
-hmm. And my mind, I can't, I can't help it, Bobby. My mind wanted to say, I don't know if it's every. So when you run across a person who doesn't look like they believe in one of those things, mm -hmm. what do you do? Yeah, I think first run, I would agree with you. Uh, yeah, you know, um, every may be uh, too general, too strong. Um, but in my experience, my observation has been that, you know, once we select someone to be a part of our organization, like we saw something in them that aligned to our values um, and aligned to the fact that we saw some gifts that they bring that could help us solve some problems that we have. So perhaps using that as, you know, the criteria. Um, I think once we, you know, once we get to that point and we make a selection and we say, Hey, this person's going to make us better and let's amplify their voice in order to do that. In those cases where, uh, you know, I call it, you, in the beginning, when you select someone to be a part of your community, we must first, I call it, turn over the resume, right? Let's bring out and learn the story about them that's not public information, right? The story that matters, the story about the lessons they've learned in life and what matters to them, what makes their heart sing, what gives them energy. Right? Well, as they join our community, and they get involved in helping us with the contribution that I just referenced while ago. Um, if we, when we identify gaps in the belief system and the value system, like we have to be very swift as leaders to identify those and have very frank conversations and say, you know what, we, we may have, we may have made a mistake here. Um, like you may be, better equipped to go make contributions somewhere else. Like you can't waste any time whatsoever. Once you identify that there's a gap in someone wanting to contribute to the bigger part of the community and also accelerate their own journey, like, uh, you, you can't, it, you're doing your community a disservice by not, you know, ending that relationship as quickly as possible, but doing it in a graceful manner that, helps that person succeed and vice versa, right? Because you saw something in them at a certain point in time and that could change. What's so funny. Um, so you just started that story though with some mm -hmm. basic pillars yeah. and because there's an assumption mm -hmm. that your hiring managers and yourself know exactly what kind of person you're looking for that will contribute to your mm -hmm. culture. You went there first before mm -hmm. you went to skill sets. That's right. Right? So you go there first. You know, because if you don't get that right, no matter what skills you have, <laughs> something's going to break down the road. So you do that first. You bet. And you called that turning the resume upside down. There's something behind it that will help mm -hmm. us understand the story that got them to those values that you're looking for. That's right. And right? I've done that. I've done that meta. I've done that physically. Like anytime that I've interviewed someone from day one of yeah. starting yeah. my, my community populist group, I sit in front of them and I'll be like, look, I'm, I'm going to flip over your resume. I'm more interested on what's on the back of the resume mm -hmm. first before we go to the other side. Right. So I'll ask them then, Hey, take me to the beginning. Take me through chapter one, chapter two. And then I just, go into listening curiosity mode. And like, I want to know everything about them because that's, what's going to matter. If I want to uh, start from the beginning and have them feel like I want more for them than from them. Like I need to know that part of their story. So funny. Uh, I did this intuitively. I didn't learn this from any book, but I did pass on this learning to my children as they entered the workplace and I said, you get in front of a hiring manager, most of them are going to be grilling you about your resume. But you need to understand something before you walk in the door. And that is, if you're going in to win, and winning means getting a job, 
then, then you're approaching it the wrong way. And, and so it'd be interesting if you would have interviewed my daughter, because they would have flipped over your resume and begun to ask you about your journey before you ask them. You're, you're unique. Most people don't do that. So they would want to get into the resume. And I'd said one of the first things you're going to say to them, quite frankly, is, is Bobby, I know you want to learn everything about what I've done. And I can't wait to answer those questions, but I need context. What drove you to start this company? You know, j- just interview them. And, and they said, why would I do that if their purpose is for them to interview me? I said, because you don't ever want to take anything that you don't know the person behind it. You want to know their values, how they think about uh, inculcating those values inside their company and their process. So, Bobby, we, you're looking for people who do that as well, I would imagine. That's right. That's right. Because, you know, it's, we, we both have a choice. We have and- a choice. And I think the embedded question, Ron, that I agree with, which was a very wise insight that you shared with your children there in that, um, I mean, you're both asking yourself a question that you're not going to say out loud. And that is, can we trust each other? Yes. And, you know, trust is the single most important asset. Any business leader, any employee is ever going to have, you know, the more you have of that, the more productive, impactful, uh, and fulfilled the organization is. I mean, matter of fact, it's the only metric I, uh, it's not the only metric, it's the metric I care about the most in my community. Like what's the level of trust in our community and being able to measure that and assess that and make decisions around that because, yeah, you know, you, uh, it drives everything. Well, you just brought up a huge factor in, um, uh and we'll call implementation, moving from philosophy and strategy to deployment. And that is how can you, by flipping over that piece of paper persistently, not only in the hiring process, the onboarding, but the management flipping over the paper, how do you instill trust? Because if I've met you for the first time, Mm-hmm. If you want to know all the mistakes I've made, I'm probably going to have a hard time sharing those for someone who I don't even know. Do you start with your own story of brokenness before you start asking about theirs? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, uh, Ron. You know, there's a, yeah, let's just, let's just make a couple of underlying assumptions, right? Like, it's situational and, and, and judgment applies. But one of the things that, for example, when, you know, when we're um, like, we lean into the power of story uh, and, and the power of, you know, being human and vulnerable within those stories. And so I believe that from my perspective, um, you know, whether I'm speaking or, you know, in a, client presentation and stuff like we'll always lead with a, with a story that helps create the safety for the audience to contribute. Um, and most of the time that does involve, you know, let me, hey, let me share with you a mistake that, that we made or, let me tell you a story that'll bring to life uh, an example that I think will highlight the essence of the problem you're trying to solve. Leaders go first, don't they? That's right. That's right. So, you know, I think we take the lead in creating the safety, mm. uh, you know, and like you're not going to tell me your story <laughs> until you know a little bit more about mine, you know, whether that be, you know, like I've, yeah. I've had more, uh, you know, when I wrote the book and I shared, you know, arguably the majority of my marker stories that shape, you know, what I believe and, and, you know, how I climb my mountain per se in the gift of struggle. And I've had so many heartwarming letters from across the world of, you know, you know when you told the bus story, I felt like it 
was my story and I was listening to you tell the story, but I was thinking about this with my family or your dad or, you know, the story I tell about my kids or, you know, it's, uh, you know, that's, I think, an example of how it creates that safety amongst yeah. one another. I love paradoxes, Bobby. And so just a few minutes ago, ago we talked about a lot of people, every, we said, um, would like to stand out, fit in, and be a part of something bigger. And mm -hmm. I also was reflecting on how those um, could be seen as contradictory, standing mm -hmm. out and yeah. fitting in aren't, 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 aren't necessarily compatible all the time. And there's a courage that has to take place in someone who seeks to pave their own way, which may be totally in contradiction to fitting in. I, and, and so I love, by the way, I love paradoxes. Mm -hmm. So I get why all three of those will at the end of a story actually fit together but not necessarily at the beginning of the story. <laughs> right. Does that make sense? It does make sense. It does make sense. Yeah. Uh, um, I, have a, I, have a, I, have a, I have a simple uh, question that I've asked myself over the years uh, to help me understand whether or not, because it's about balance, right? It's about mm -hmm. um, you know, doing it in a manner that advances the narrative for everyone. And the question is, it's actually... You know, uh, it's a second part of um, the 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 book, and that is, am I giving more than I'm taking? And you know, because there's a there's a way to self assess that, right? And you're giving more than you take, like it keeps that, it helps keep that in balance in a way that serves what we're craving to help others and advancing the overall narrative without it becoming a, um, a selfish endeavor per se. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. And again, the paradox, mm -hmm. you're not actually talking about balance. A lot of people say work-life balance and what they mm -hmm. really mean is work eight to five weekends free and, if you're starting a company that may not happen in, um, in your Jan January, 2020 blog, uh, I was just laughing because some of the first things you tell us to ask ourselves before we go on a great endeavor is about understanding the accounts you need to quantify at the end of the day. Right. But, but, but I also know there's seasons. There may be seasons where I can eat dinner with my family. Mm -hmm. There may be seasons I can't. Right. But I think what you just said beautifully, and I'm translating in my words, so I apologize. Mm -hmm. Again, by the fireplace, just having a conversation. Mm -hmm. But I almost get the sense that you're talking a lifetime here, not a week or a month or a year. Am I That's right? right. You're, you're correct. I mean, it's a journey, right? You know, I, I use the mountain metaphor a lot um, because one, I have a deep passion for the mountains. Mount Rainier is actually my favorite mountain. And, uh, but, you know, I believe we're all climbing our own mountain in mm -hmm. the sense that, you know, there's a place that we imagine that looks and feels better than where we are today. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is figure out, Hey, how do I take control of this story that I'm narrating to get to that place that I imagine? And there is no like straight trail up any mountain worth climbing that is. And, you know, so we tend to massively overestimate what we can do in a day or a week and significantly underestimate what we can do in a year, in two years. And I call it, you know, and I, I use this, met, this uh, a lot. I say, hey, the long way is a shortcut. I say that to my kids all the time. It's like the long way is a shortcut. Take the long way, take the long way, play the long game. Um, you know, the stream always wins, right? Like um, you have to just build consistency in doing this over time and it'll work. Um, you know, a little bit about my background and how I was pretty 
incredibly process and measurement driven in my early career. Um, but it was really interesting because when I first ran across Deming's, um, Deming's uh, philosophy that 80% of the quality of a process is in the first 20% of a cycle, that was statistical process control. That was Pareto principle. It was implied mm -hmm. in process manufacturing. And then I started realizing, because I had to study that because I was in computer-aided design and manufacturing, but I started realizing that that could actually be somewhat of a insightful life principle too. The right. idea of go slow to go fast, which is essentially what you just said. That's you know, right. understand really the first few things and all the rest can fall into place. That's right. Yeah, one foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. That's it. Um, it one, one last question. Uh, mm -hmm. And this one's a really important one to me. So I'm, I'm being selfish in this virtual fireplace chat. You, one of the first questions you ask in your blog is what gives me energy? And mm -hmm. then you say this. This question is about purpose, identity, and meaning. And I started thinking to myself, okay, what gives me energy? What gives me energy? And can I make that direct connection? Mm -hmm. It gives me energy. And it's almost a chicken and egg, isn't it? it? I think what you're describing is if I can look at what gives me energy and realize it's driving my story around purpose, identity, and meaning, and vice versa, that gets into, that's another paradox you just thrown at us. Mm -hmm. What were you telling yourself when you came up with what gives me energy? What story is behind that? Uh, well, <clears throat> a couple. Well, the, the driving story behind that is encouraging, um, encouraging um, people to go back and in a sense, identify their own bus story, like mm -hmm. the one that I tell in chapter one. Right. right? So, um, and, you know, like, I believe that most, not all, most of us have some event or some moment in our life that somehow gave us, um, or an experience, you know, that somehow gave us curiosity to want to like do something meaningful, right? whether something that, you know, moved us and inspired us, or, you know, sometimes it's a reverse role model, right? Like you, you hear of organizations being created because of a kid's family going through some hardship and, you know, they experienced such hardship that they wanted to create something to help other families or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I believe we all have something in our life that inspired us to drive some form of change to help others. Right. And in the end, uh, if you ever, you know, have anyone that's ever read like, you know, Victor Frankl's and the meaning of life, like, you know, we're, we're here to serve others and make their life easier uh, and contribute. And that starts with looking back and doing a, you know, I call it a deep excavation of your marker moments and understanding like, why is it that that had such a profound impact on me? And because we remember those moments, we remember those stories. And if you can go back and have a meaningful excavation of those moments in your life, you'll find it. Like there's something there that drives you and something that you want to do as a result of that experience. And you know, I do the lot when I do, you know, my pay forward workshops for, you know, veteran entrepreneurs or minority entrepreneurs. I'll often ask that question and do some exercises around that to have them go back and do it. And it creates some really meaningful dialogue around. This has been a great conversation with Bobby Herrera. And if you get a chance, um, I would suggest if you want to get a taste, a little bit taste of the bus story, go to amazon.com because they give you a, 
a free Robbie Herrera voiceover on the bus, on the bus story. And uh, it will be one of those moments that Bobby just talked about. It will stick with you probably the rest of your life. Bobby, thank you so much for being in the great conversation. Yeah, God bless you, Ron, and I'll hail the underdogs. Thanks for having me.